OK, Charles Leclerc has lost the championship lead, but can the mighty Monegas turn home advantage into a win this weekend? Hello and welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 198, where we're going to be previewing the 2022 Monaco Grand Prix. I'm your host, George Housen, and joining me today is Adam Burns from the DNF1 podcast. Hi, George. And Carl King from the Monkey Seat podcast. Good day. So, lads, let's get into this. Obviously, we were not too uh, not too confident about Spain being a great race this season, I don't think, but it absolutely delivered. So what can we expect from Monaco this weekend, Adam? As I've mentioned, Leclerc, he's very bitterly disappointed, as is the Ferrari fandom, at his retirement in Spain, but they did look very quick. And Charles Leclerc legitimately got pole position there last year. So how do you see this championship fight going into round number seven? Well, we've had six races so far, and both Leclerc and Verstappen, Red Bull, Ferrari equally, have obviously had times where they've had the best car. They've had times where they've had fortune at the other's expense. And it has evened itself out between the two leading contenders to the point now where we are in a position where Max Verstappen has closed that lead back up. We've now got 16 races left in the season. We've had that first cohort of upgrades, which seems to have brought them on a level playing field again, when there were fears that Red Bull may have stolen a march on Ferrari. So, it's still all to play for. What we do know, though, is that Red Bull do seem to have that momentum still. Verstappen, in particular, every race he finishes, he wins. Although in Spain, it wasn't as formidable as we we're expecting for Max Verstappen, but he still got the job done in the end. The team got the job done for him, of course. Ferrari do need to pick this up. Leclerc needs to pick himself up. And despite the history around Leclerc's success rate at Monaco, this is the perfect opportunity for him to turn it around. And and at this circuit, it's probably one that will suit his car. So the question remains is if he can finish, and that's a big if based on history, he will fancy his chances to win and get himself back on track this season. Yeah, that's that's the very interesting thing about uh, this this race coming up, up now. I mean, Monaco, you know, Charles Leclerc, despite being from there, he's never finished a race there, at least in Formula 1. I think it goes all the way back to F2 and F3 as well. He, it is not a lucky circuit for him at all, but he has shown great pace there. And Max Verstappen, every time he finishes a race, he wins it, at least this season anyway. So it's a very interesting fight for this for this championship, Carl. And of course, we could have a third team in the mix as well, given how they performed in Spain. Mercedes looking a lot quicker. George Russell legitimately getting a podium in Barcelona. And Lewis Hamilton with an unbelievingly storming drive to get through the field again. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I think, you can't base everything down on one race. I think it's not going to be a, I don't think Mercedes are back. I like everyone's going, Oh, a three team race, a three team race. I don't think it is. I think they're too late um, and too late out of the gate. Now Um, there's two bigger, stronger teams ahead of them. That card just has, still has issues. Okay. They might have slightly fixed the floor there, um, but it's not going to be, anything worth writing home about i don't think maybe i'm wrong um i obviously we've you know hamilton is as well versed that track it'd be interesting what how that car in russell's hands goes around that very tight track if it's anything like miami i'm not too sure it's going to do that well um the mercs car is all over the place still um and you know just because ocon won the race once doesn't mean he's a world champion and i think we're now still in that race you know just because the mercs did well in one race and had quite a bit of fortuity let's be honest uh if leclerc car hadn't gone out they wouldn't have been they would have been again you know down the ranks um and there was lots of spins and and even verstappen being where he was was uh originally you know he obviously won but like coming up the ranks um it probably with the, that tailwind and things. So I think Ham, I think Hamilton and Russell, you know, it'd be interesting to see. I hope they do well. I don't think they will. Um, I don't think that car really suits Monaco, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, historically, at least, Mercedes have not done over. I mean, yes, they've won a lot at Monaco, of course. They've won a lot everywhere in general in the, in the hybrid era. But over time, the cars, especially like the Red Bull, have been better around that circuit quite often. And Hamilton, I think, has only won twice or three times, which by his standards is very low, uh, considering especially how much they've raced there over the years, or at least he has. So it's going to be interesting. The Mercedes have definitely made ground, but whether they'll be up there with Ferrari and Red Bull, it, it's tough to say. It's possible, but it's tough to say. 
Um, someone who will be hoping for a much better weekend, though, uh, coming into this is uh, going to be Carlos Sainz, Adam. Now, I really like Sainz. I think for the last two, three years, he's been one of the most consistent drivers on the grid, if not the most consistent. That this season is perhaps showing the difference between a guy who can outperform a car in the midfield and a guy who can struggle in a championship challenging car, potentially a championship winning car. You know, he's he's made a number of mistakes through this season, but Monaco last year was one of his best races. He got second place. How do you see him getting on this weekend? It's hard to say with Carlos Sainz. I mean, one of the aspects or one of the key attributes in what has made him such a uh, lucrative driver for Ferrari and what was made him so sought after by a lot of big teams before he joined the Scuderia was his consistency and his amazing ability to extract the most he possibly can from the package that he had available to him. He's been far from that this season and it's been a huge surprise to everyone. I think a lot of people looked at this pairing with Leclerc and Sainz, arguably putting it at the very, very front of uh, the grid in terms of performance between the two drivers. You know, you, you could argue it was the best pairing. and. Whilst Leclerc, for the most part, has really stepped on and pushed on this season, Carlos Sainz has fallen back. Possibly there may be too much in Sainz's head over trying to keep up with his teammate. Maybe he's not focusing at the job at hand, but at the moment he's got the tools underneath him to produce those big performances and possibly win a race or two this season. But so far he's really struggling under the pressure. And there's certainly been a few races now you know, you've got Imola, obviously that incident with Ricardo, which was a bit unlucky. But of course, if he'd, you know, not put himself so far back in the sprint race where he has to recover it, he probably wouldn't have been in that position anyway. Um, you had Australia where he had that mistake. And then, you know, since then, and obviously we saw last weekend, it wasn't a great start. He possibly could have won that race if he'd kept it all together and, you know, took advantage of the opportunities. He certainly had the package, but those mistakes cost him. So it's a big weekend for Carlos Sainz. And I think the last thing you want right now is being a Ferrari driver under that much pressure when you've got a car capable of doing so much more than he's doing right now with it. I don't think it's an ability thing at all. I think he's certainly capable of getting more out of this car, but he really needs to put it all together now. And the pressure is mounting on him. And after signing that new contract recently, you'd have thought that that would have allowed him to have a new lease of life and really crack on with things. But uh, he just needs to put it all together. It's the little things. It's nothing major or anything spectacular. Perhaps he's overdriving this car at times, but he does need to find a way to put this all together. Because right now, I don't really like this idea of turning most discussions on F1 into a Carlos Sainz sympathy corner. But right now, that's kind of what we're getting at the moment. Yeah, we have, you know, we have to call it as it is. At the end of the day, he's been in incredible form for a number of years. And so far this season, on the whole, you know, he's been, he's been pretty hit and miss. I mean, third and the fourth place in the last two races does not look too bad, but it doesn't tell the full story, really. It's those two retirements in Australia and uh, Miller are really hurting him. And, you know, he's fallen behind George Russell in the standings, Carl, but that's possibly because of George Russell's incredible consistency this season. I mean, Hamilton's had some bad luck. He's had some he's had some not-so-great moments this season, for sure, but... George Russell this this year has really, really impressed me. I, I thought he'd do well, but I didn't think he'd be doing this well. I mean, another podium out in Spain. How much has he impressed you so far this year in Mercedes? Uh he hasn't. And uh, do you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna I throw, throw this. I feel you'd say that. That's going why I to, you. Yeah, it's gonna throw <laughs> this completely back. I don't think he has. I don't think he's done anything amazing. Okay, we saw a little spark last weekend of his racecraft. And let's be honest, we don't, we've never seen that because when he was in the Williams, he never did anything. I think he's always sat in a bit of no man's land in a lot of the races. I don't feel he's ever had a real fighting, fighting chance of anything. And he's just found himself there because although that Mercedes is not that great, it's still better than half the other cars on the track, no matter how, you know, how we do it. But, uh, you know, out of the 10 cars on that track, He's, they're better than five. He's, they're always going to be better than the Williams. They're always going to be fighting the Hasses. The Alpines is a crock of rubbish. So, like, what can you expect? Um, so, it, it's it, it's always that game with him and with Merck. Always is, is the car the driver. I still think he's grand. He's consistent. He's not crashing. But then he's nowhere, he's not near anyone to crash most of the time in this season. Um, he's sort of been in that no man's land. He's not having that fighting chance, uh, that fight that we saw. And the first time when we did see the fights um, this weekend, okay, he battled um, Verstappen hard. 
uh, but let's who did that through signs or um, or Perez? I can't remember if it was both of them. Um, and that's the problem: is that actually he fights the fight when he wants to, but he's not that great. I love setting Carl off on a run. It, it's so easy to do. It's so easy. To do. I, I picked up your tips from uh, Tom Horace with that. And, I'm uh, expecting that. <laughs> I was, and that's why I asked the question. Uh, but you know, it, it's at the end of the day, it's an opinion. And if people agree with you, Carl, I'm sure they'll let us know in the comments and in the reviews. Um, I'm yeah, sure. I'm sure. Like people will have an opinion on it, and it's grand, and that's part of the fun is to have an opinion on these things. And that it doesn't mean anyone's right, not in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah exactly at the end of the day if we all just agreed about everything there'd be no debate around Formula 1 and that's what we love um, and we'd also love it it's a bit of a segue but if we'd also love it if you gave us a 5 star review on iTunes or for that matter Spotify as well you can give us 5 star reviews on there now anybody who gives us a 5 star review on iTunes or Apple Music they get a shout out at the start of the show so just yeah if you want to get your presence known in the show if you want to support us that's a great way to do it um, but yeah, let's let's move on. Let's move on to the team who are in fourth place in the Constructors Championship, McLaren. Now, very up and down season to say the least for them, Adam, after the first few races. I was really fearing the worst for them. They've picked themselves up since then. They seem to go better at cooler tracks, but it was very hot in Spain and the car was all right. It was all right, especially in the hands of Lando Norris, who... I mean, I listened to the um, the radios after the race and Lando Norris didn't even say a word. He he was in a bad way. He was very ill this weekend and just gone. And he and he still got a point to finish. But again, again, no points for Ricardo. But can Monaco offer another chance for him? Because this is his best circuit on the calendar, I'd say. Well, I'm not going to go as Hal Mary with this as Carl and say that Ricardo is all of a sudden mid. Um, but I, it, it's a crazy one with Danny Rick because this is a guy that, we talked about not too long ago as a driver that had world championship material winning, or at least some people did. The guy's won, has been great at winning races that have been exciting and have, have always been in the position to take the opportunity when it comes to him. Unfortunately, those races have been fewer and further between. All right, we had Monza last year and he did a great job. But overall, for whatever reason, the Danny Rick that McLaren thought they were signing has not turned up. And this year, it's kind of compounded even worse because... You can't really make the excuses for him now that McLaren have got a car that's suited for Norris's interest because this is a new car. This would have been one that would have had his own input in there. And even by his own admission, he has been struggling for performance. So McLaren are certainly going to be asking those questions of Ricardo, And I think they're right to in that regard because you've got Lando Norris, who I believe I read that he's actually got tonsillitis. That's what he was struggling with ultimately. And that's why on the team radio, he couldn't even talk. He had to signal with a button on the steering wheel just to let his radio, uh, race engineer know that he was okay and that bringing it home. And then he's still delivering a great performance and getting points despite all of that. And then you've got Ricardo who qualified ahead of him and just fell down the order out of the points again. And he's really, really struggling with this car for whatever reason. And McLaren are also paying in the big bucks as well to deliver what they thought they were going to get. It's almost with all due respect to Daniel Ricardo, they've bought a Daniel Ricardo that you would have bought off a wish rather than a drive, you know, the Daniel Ricciardo they thought they were getting. And I know that it's a bit of a, you know, a sly dig, but right now I really hope for his sake that he can turn it around because, and I'm trying not to laugh as I'm watching you guys laughing, but. Um, <laughs> That's quality. Uh, yeah, that he, I mean, yeah. He, is his wish really where they got him from? Because I think it's somewhere on eBay secondhand. At the end of the day, you know, we all want Danny Rick to really up his A game. And this is a circuit we hope that he can do that. A race that obviously had his redemption win and should have won in 2016 as well. But it's it's one of those that he has to find a way to put this together. And the clock is ticking because we're already hearing names like Colson Herter or Pato Award. We might even look at the F1 grid already. There might be a few drivers up there right now that might need a seat and might look at the opportunity. I know Pierre Gasly might be keeping his eye out on a big seat and maybe they'll go coming for him. So Whatever Danny Ricardo can do to refine that form, he has to do it now. There's literally no more time to mess around, and I really hope he can pull it together and turn it around. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with him. You said to it, and it pains me to agree with you because the thing is, I love Ricardo. He's my favourite driver in the grid. I want to see him do well, and McLaren, my favourite team as well. I thought it was a match made in heaven, but it's just not worked out, and I, I really don't know why. I really, I can't figure it out. It's you know, I mean, well, I, th- I think it without. It's Nand- Lando being the golden boy. 
and the fact that he's Zach Brown's favourite child and he is performing when you're that old compared to the young whippersnapper that's out wiping you day in, day out. Your, your ego and your your enthusiasm for being in that team is going to drop, and especially when Daddy Zach is favouriting the little young whippersnapper. I think that's it. It definitely doesn't help. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, at the end of the day, Ricardo is a professional racing driver and he's in his 12th season in F1, I think, off the top of my head. And, you know, he's a very experienced guy. He's very quick. We know he's quick. He's a, world, you know, he's a, he's a winner. He's a guy who was touted as a future world champion after 2014. We all thought he was going to be up there one day. That's not worked out, sadly, but he's hardly alone in that regard. But it's an interesting one. But let us know what you guys think on um, on, on the YouTube channel. We've got, we do go out live every for every preview, every qualifying, every race review. Uh, we go out live on our YouTube channel. Just search for F1 Grid Talk on, on YouTube. We're at over 500 subscribers now, which is brilliant. We're getting close to that 1K every single weekend. So thank you so much for that. Um, but yeah, so let's move on to the team that I still can't believe this I up to honest with you. Alfa Romeo in fifth place going into this race. I mean, obviously it is 100% down to, uh, down to Valtteri Bottas's efforts pretty much. Um, but it's just, it's just been a revelation for them, Carl, because they were in their absolute doldrums for years. And this year, they've got Bottas, they've got a much better car, and it's just working out for them. So how do you see them getting on this weekend? I think this weekend, they do what they're doing at the moment. They're in those nice sort of five to eight plate places, you know, five to nine places. They're staying in there. They will be in there, keep being in there. Um, Grosjean, oh, I can never pronounce his name. Grosjean Yu, Yu um, will be, um, will not, I mean, he'll be out of the points. Um, but then this is his rookie year. He's allowed to be out of the points. That is a terrible track to be. It's a hard track for a rookie because it's not one that's constantly on the circuit anyway. And it's not one you can go and practice on or really know about. Um, and it's a bit of a strange circuit. Um, I think you've got... Uh, Bottas is flying. I don't know what's gone on with him. And I don't know whether it's a revigor of the that being in a new team or, or what happened. Let's be, be honest, where at the end of last season, he suddenly woke up as well, uh, when he got the contract for Alfa Romeo, who suddenly woke up and suddenly became a really good driver. Um, I think he's a steady pair of hands. We've always said this. I think everyone's always said that, that actually that's his thing. And the car is good. It looks good. It goes good and it's um and it's got the ferrari engine in it and that i think is the winning combination and uh and i'm so glad i wish it wasn't alfa romeo and it had a decent team name and a decent car but you know we can't have everything um uh so yeah i think let's see what happens but i think it there'll be the usual mid-pack we'll all be surprised that bottas is fifth or sixth which he will be um and it'll be one of those races um i think yeah joe will just go out at some point or he'll just be in the back of the field um but this is his ricky year i'm not gonna i think he is does still hold promise um i don't think for me although tom disputes the facts uh he's better than Sonoda uh, in this time last year to match match for match as to where he is but in my mind he's a better driver than Sonoda was in his rookie year at this period it's, it's definitely opinion I mean I definitely more consistent for sure not as much pace I don't think but you know Sonoda had like one flash in the pan that was it for the first 15 16 races of that season yeah. Plus this season, I think he's doing a lot better. I think he's he's really matured this year. Um, he's doing a lot better. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, for Bottas especially, I mean, he's been qualifying extremely well, normally top five, top six. And we all know how quali- how important qualifying is around Monaco. So if he can hold that, it could be a massive point hole for Alfa Romeo this weekend. Um, but yeah, let's move on to, uh, to Alpine. Alpine, sixth place in the Constructors' Championship. Fernando Alonso finally getting some more points on the board in his home race. Uh, Esteban Ocon again quietly doing his business. You know, he, he's just he's a, he's been a lot better this season. In previous seasons for me, he's been he's been consistent, but he's also been he's raised the bar, he's raised the game. I mean, it, it's early days, Adam, but it is looking as though Ocon could force Alonso out of that team. I mean, why why would Alpine want to pay Alonso massive amounts of money just to run around in a position that potentially Oscar Piastri could achieve. 
Well, that's the hope, isn't it, with Piastri, that he's going to get an opportunity sooner rather than later. If I was a betting man, I wouldn't bet on it being Alpine anytime soon. I could very much see Alpine trying to move or manoeuvre Piastri into possibly a Williams seat or maybe an Aston Martin seat on a loan basis in the way that Albon is at Williams at the moment. So Alonso, yeah, you're absolutely right, George. is an expensive driver to keep, especially when he's not getting any younger. He's certainly not driving like a driver who's 40 and, and certainly on his way out of Formula One. He's been quite unlucky at times, Fernando, but then there have been other races where he has made the wrong move at the wrong time and cost himself points. And then you've got Esteban Ocon, who has been incredibly consistent and gone completely under the radar. Like I had to double take to see that he'd finished seventh in Spain. And that's kind of what he's been doing this season. You know, Alpine started the season with a very good car in qualifying and a poor car in the race. It's now gone the other way around. You know, they weren't very good in qualifying. We thought those upgrades were a bit of a dud after qualifying with both their cars not making Q3. Alonso out in Q1 in his home circuit. During the race, at a circuit that's traditionally normally hard to overtake on, they managed to both fly through the field, take advantage of other drivers' misfortunes and get some solid points for the team. So at this Grand Prix... It's going to be very, very tough for Alpine to repeat that because they're going to need the car to be good in quality trim rather than in the race. But right now, you know, if Alonso can, you know, keep his nose clean and stay out of trouble and put in those good performances and Ocon just keeps doing what he's doing, Alpine is certainly a dark horse to be best of the rest in the Constructors' Championship come later on in the season because right now, of all those teams in the midfield, they're the only one that probably has both their drivers that are actually performing to a standard where they could both get points on a regular basis. Yeah, that, that's very true. I mean, I, I mean, Alonso has been very unlucky. I, anybody admit that? Um, I just think, I just think it's, uh, yeah, he's not covering himself with too much glory this season. But this could be a great springboard for him. He is very good around Monaco. It is a lot about the driver's skill, and I think Alpine will also do well this week. And I think they'll, the, the car will suit this track. But we'll see what happens with that. Um, um, we'll move on to to Alpha Tauri now in seventh place in the constructors. That doesn't seem so bad, but I feel like the car is is definitely a step down from uh, from last year's effort. But as I mentioned before, Yuki Tsunoda, he's doing all right. He's a lot more consistent this year, and and Pierre Gasly legitimately is getting beaten by him regularly so far this season, or at least half the time or so. So it's an interesting one for them, Carl. How do you see them both getting on in Monaco? Gasly's gone off the boil, hasn't he, completely? I don't know where he is or what he's doing. He doesn't seem to be there. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Snowder is consistent. He's calmed down. He's suddenly grown up. Um, the Alban teaching has obviously helped. Um, and he's just a lot calmer and a lot more, you know, he's actually quite inter- interesting to watch. The problem is we could never see much of him because he's in the mid-pack and not fighting the fights of the big, you know, the ex-winners um, that we are having, that we normally end up watching because the TV can't actually show you anything of any use um, of what's going on. Um, we'd rather look at the crowd. Um, but yeah, I think um, Gasly is off the boil. He does this occasionally, though. He did it again last year. Um, he sort of, he obviously did, he did it at Red Bull back in the day as well. And and then he suddenly gets a revigor of something. Um, I don't know quite what it is. That car isn't that car isn't performing. I don't think. I think um, Snowder is out driving that car, and Gasly's driving it because that's all he's got given. Um, I understand that um, there was issues with the RBR engine um, originally, and that was causing problems. I think that was being used as an excuse. I think that is a completely different car. Um, and, and sorry, it's a completely different, of course, it's a completely different car. Uh, it's a completely different uh, issues that are causing the, it's not just the engine. Uh, how he'll do around this track. I think Gadley and, and Snowden should do quite well around this track. I think there'll be the dark horses that will be in sixth, seventh, eighth, that you didn't expect them to be. I think, they'll probably end up in points, both of them. Um, I thought, because, because I think they're possibly better in the far, in the slower corners, um, being a red, uh, being a, the slower ver- version of the Red Bull, if you will. 
definitely possible. It's definitely possible. And Gasly is due a good result. And I'm sure I'm sure he'll get one soon. But yeah, he's not, he's not been performing too well this season overall. But the car is not the same animal that it was last year either. So there's there's that too. Um but a car that's definitely improved from last season is the Haas. They found themselves in eighth place going into into this race. Um Mick Schumacher, I was I was absolutely convinced that Spain was going to be the race where he got his first point. It didn't work out. Um, obviously, Monaco is very different. It's very hard to overtake there. Nigh on impossible to overtake there, even with these new cars, I imagine, as well. Uh, Kevin Magnussen fell, fell off a little bit recently. Um, I, I personally feel like he was to blame for the, for the crash with him and Hamilton. It seemed like he just went a bit into him in that corner. Um, racing instance, fair enough, though. If you're going to blame someone, though, I would personally blame Magnussen. But... But yeah, Madison getting some good results this season. Can, can the Haas get up there into the points again? Adam, it feels like a long time. And can uh, Schumacher get his first points finally in Formula One? Well, I keep banging the drum saying that Mick's going to get points at almost every race over the last few races. And each time, for one reason or another, it just doesn't work out. In Spain, I, I thought it could happen. The way the race was unfolding, he got himself up into P6 early in the race. And I thought, surely now, if he can keep his nose clean and drive a solid race, he can get it over the line. Granted, the Haas has not had any of the upgrades that any of the other teams have had, so that's obviously set them back a little bit. But it was quite disappointing to see as the race was unfolding, it started to fall away for him. And I can't really put my finger on to why that is, because I know he's, he's a better driver than he's driving right now. But I don't know how he's going to be able to turn this around. And yes, granted, having a name like Schumacher is certainly going to open doors for you and perhaps give you a little bit more leniency than it would to other drivers. And I think I'm probably one that would be accused of that in, in a way. And, but at the same time, he's going to get to a point where he's going to have to start delivering and it's, it's going to come sooner rather than later. This would be a great race for him to do that. And perhaps that will set him off. You know, once he gets that one off his back, he gets the points in the way Russell did. You're able just to drive to a new level and focus on bigger and better things. As for Magnussen, yeah, I think it's probably fair over what happened in Spain. It felt more like a rain sitting incident because, of course, you know, I know some people saying, yes, Lewis's car understeered. It wasn't Lewis's fault. It just happened. But at the same time, it was very, very minor. And Magnussen on, at turn four, when you're on the outside like that on the first lap, if you're that close to the car alongside you and something happened, you're lending yourself to Hamilton not having any issues and driving that corner as if he's hugging his favorite grandma and that didn't happen. So, you know, you can look at it one way or the other, um, but he has dropped off a little bit, but I think Kane and Mag is a known entity. And I think while surprising a lot of people, he's proven that he's a good driver, something we knew about him already. So for us this weekend, um, it's hard to really predict where they are. It's a good car. It's still a good car. But I just feel that, you know, downforce is going to be key at this circuit. And I think the upgrades that some of the other teams have made that allowed them to mitigate the porpoising issue, something that Haas didn't really have to worry about too much from the get-go, I think that could prove to be a bit too much for them to try and get points this weekend. I think they're going to be on the fringes, but not quite there this weekend. Yeah, I have to say I agree. I feel like some of the early season, earlier season pace from, from the Haas has dropped off a little bit and they're just not quite in the top 10 just yet. But you never know. Crazy things do happen at Monaco sometimes. And we could have a few retirements and, and what have you, especially with porpoising. I mean, I imagine, I mean, I imagine porpoising around Monaco is the absolute last thing you want. So we'll see how that goes. They well, qualify think- quite well, George. You know, they, they do qualify the Hasses quite well. Being, you know, so I think you've got more of a chance this in <laughs> Monaco because they do qualify so well. And they are doing they're good at that one lap speed and they get it caught in traffic and they get to drive wherever the hell they want. That's where the problems lie. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point, Carl. That's a good point. Um, same, same is true for Alfa Romeo as well. The Ferrari seem to qualify. Ferrari powered cars, I should say, seem to qualify extremely well and just fall back a little bit in the race, just a tiny bit, some of them sometimes. Um, uh, but another team that, no, sorry, another team that's, that's been running outside the points for most this season, uh, Aston Martin. Uh, now, despite some of the uh, some of the borrowed elements, we'll put it that way, that they got uh, installed in Spain, they were, they were still well off the pace, Carl. Um, they might as well get their photocopy and start pushing that round. It'd be quicker. It, it would be at this point. Just attach some wheels to it and get it going. <laughs> but saying that, we're ahead of the Williams in the championship because uh, that one race in Imola, um, I, I, I personally... Can't really see them doing anything this weekend. Um, I mean, Vettel will do his best, but we can't do so much. Oh, jeez. I mean, 
when can we get rid of Stroll? Oh, no, we can't because Daddy's owned this company. Are we still going on about that? I, I mean, like, literally, it's just so painful, isn't it? It's like him and Latifi. It's like, go away. Um, they're about, like bad smells. It just really won't go away. And Those they used to, Canadians, eh? At least, yeah, at least, at, least the, at least the smell goes around the track faster. Um, they're just, you, I mean, I don't know what's going on. It, do you know what? I had such high hopes that... that um, that Aston because it looked gorgeous when they released it. I was like, that's a nice looking car. Personally, it was my favorite looking car back in the day. Um, I slightly changed my mind now, but um, no, it's that I mean, all looks and no style was back in the day, and now it's all copycats and still no style. Um, the problem is that no, even if they go say they didn't copycat it, um, they don't know how their car works. And neither do the drivers know how to drive a car that doesn't work. And that's the problem. That's always been the problem with Aston Martin is, or the pink Mercedes or whatever you want to call them. Um, they, they had no idea. They, they take concepts of other people um, and other ideas, and then they have no idea how it works. They just think if they photocopy it and put it on, it'll be fine. And, but there's a lot more science into that and a lot more that goes into that world. Um, the Astons are slow, they're boring, they're not going to do anything apart from crash into a wall or crash into someone else. Um, and if the four, them and Williams, have a little crash derby at the back, it might add some fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really can't see Aston doing much this weekend. Um, I think Williams have personally got a slightly bigger chance just because of Albon. He's done some mega performances this season so far for me. Um, but the other driver, obviously the Tifi, can't really see him doing too much. I mean, what's your thoughts on the Madden? I mean, I suppose maybe Vettel and and Albon might try running really long or something like that for Aston Martin and Williams, and just kind of see if it works. But other than a crazy strategy like that, they're just too slow, frankly, and it's really sad to see. Well, Spain wasn't very encouraging for Williams. You know, it was a circuit that was supposed to provide opportunity for perhaps Williams to, you know, they go into it with this, arguably the slowest car most of the time, but of course not too slow to a point where a driver like Albon, when he has a good race, can make up the difference, which before Spain, that's what he was doing. Um, Spain was not a good circuit for them. And, you know, we often say about Spain, that it's a circuit that if your car is good, it will shine. If it's bad, you will be exposed. And I think in Williams's case, it was definitely more the latter. Whatever upgrades that they brought definitely didn't work to the desired effect. Now, of course, it may just be a case that they're still trying to learn certain facets of this car. And as we saw at the start of the season, there might be room for improvement and it will get better. I certainly hope that it does. But for Williams to get a good result this weekend coming, I think you're right, George. I think it's going to have to come from um, an Albono masterclass that we've seen a few times this year or just a really fortunate strategy or a crazy race, something like that. Maybe Latifi has to do the team job and, you know, get a safety car out when Albon needs a free pit stop or something. I don't know. I'm not implying that's what they're going to do. You know, we don't want to do a crash gate again, like we saw in Singapore 08. But, you know, it it may require something crazy like that for Williams to get some points this weekend because I just can't see them finishing anywhere other than dead dead last, unfortunately. And I hate saying that because I like Williams a lot. I totally agree. The same as you. I I just hate to be the truth, but unfortunately they are probably the slowest. I think Aston on the whole are probably slower, but it's just that one flash in the pan result in Imola that's really carrying them. Um, I think Williams on the whole are slightly better, but yeah, Spain was absolutely pain for them, unfortunately. they were The only guy they beat was Magnussen, who was speared off in the first cup on the first lap. So, you know, he, he was just running tyres that were just... Well, I forgot they were in the race, did you? Because I didn't see a Williams in the race. I, I forgot they were in the race at all. Yeah, but that's because of the rubbish filming. I don't know what's wrong with them at the moment. Don't worry, we're going to get the drones out. (laughs) Bonkers. Everyone who had red hair by then afterwards as well. So it's all good. What what stupid gimmick are we going to have at at Monaco this week? I mean, we had the... We had the, we've had the eye camera. We've now had the drone. Um, we've had the boat. What gimmick are we going to have at Monaco? Oh, because normally it's the like queen of balcony, gimmicks. Balcony cam or something like that. going to get people. Well, yeah, there'll be a balcony it. cam. There'll be something like that, or boat cam. There'll be one on a boat floating around in the sea. Oh, give Leclerc a chance. He might be able to. Oh, in the swimming pool. Alone. You watch. Oh. If, Leclerc, if Leclerc crashes out early, as we're all expecting him to, he could probably film it from his own balcony the rest of the race. So give it time. <laughs> Do a right for a fan. Yeah, just oh. do a right and go, go for his yacht and have a nice 
Yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. Co- the Cornetto <laughs> camp. Yes. <laughs> oh, what gimmick God. are we going to get? Oh, my God, that drone was so painful. <laughs> it was obvious that it couldn't fly over the track because yeah. the helicopter was above it. So yeah. it was obviously in a line of where it could go, but you couldn't see anything. It was just pointless. It was <laughs> absolutely pointless. So I'm sure we'll end up with some stupid thing at, um, at Monaco because they seem to like them. Did you notice that they only used it in the third sector? Because it was clearly the only place where they had half a chance to keep up with the cars. And yeah. even then it was still falling behind. Yeah, but also it can go you could it could only go in the inside of the track because I've seen drones chase Formula One cars around tracks and they can keep up. They're they're bloody fast things. Well, but, <laughs> but that one, I don't know who was the driver of it. They were a pilot of it. Someone Jesus. bought that on wish as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Mazepin's back driving the drone. You never oh, know. That, uh, oh, it's a Russian that. spy drone. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Oh, it out, I think I saw a personal best next to his name at the end of the race. And there we know. You never know. <laughs> oh God! All right. So yeah. So those are all. Those are all the drivers and all the teams. Uh, before we get into the predictions, I will give you a reminder that if you want to check out some of our merchandise, like this shirt that I'm wearing, like this glass that I'm drinking from, you can head over to our shop at f1chronicle.com forward slash store and you'll be able to check out all the good stuff we've got on there. Um, so, man, it's so difficult for me to predict this personally. You know what? I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's high time the duck finally gets broken. I'm going to say that Charlotte Claire is going to win this weekend. That's more, I hope, than expectation, I'll be honest with you. I think, Verstappen, I think for the first time, Verstappen will not win a race that he finishes this season. I think he'll get second. And third place. You know what? I'll go, I'll go bold. This might be my bold prediction as well. I'll go for Lando Norris for a podium. Again, I think he got a podium there last season as well. So we'll see. If he's feeling better, that is, because anybody who's had tonsillitis will know how horrible it is. And doing that in 40 degree heat. I've been thrown around by a Formula One car in overalls. That's just my idea of hell. I'll be personally honest. I'll be honest with you. Um, Adam, what's your top three predictions? Um, well, I'm going to agree with your top two. I agree. I think it's high time that the Leclerc duck gets broken and he actually gets the result. And in a way, he kind of needs to, I think, to get his championship back on track. Um, Verstappen, yeah, I think he'll do what he does best and be solid. But I think P2, probably because the car... This track will favour Ferrari a bit more. I just think the acceleration and the, the ability in the slow corners the Ferrari have will certainly uh, be the trump card this weekend out of the two. And I'm going to go really bold this weekend. I'm going to go Valtteri Bottas, P3, yeah. because that Alpha is also very good in the slow corners and it's got that Ferrari power unit. So I think this could be a track that could really suit that car. And I think Bottas could really nail it this weekend. So I'm going to go Bottas, P3. To whom it may concern. Mm-hmm. We could, see it, we, we could see it back, uh, Carl. <laughs> um, your top three? See, I was going to, I mean, you, I'm going to blend your two um, in some ways. I, I think it's going to be a Ferrari one, two, three uh, in the sense of, of I don't care which Ferraris, but of in the, uh, of the engines, but I think it'll probably be uh, Leclerc or Sainz, Sainz Leclerc. I think they're probably interchangeable, but I think it'd be nice to see Leclerc get it. I'd like him to get it. He's obviously has the power to race that he I mean he got pole last time while in a worse Ferrari so hopefully he'll get it this time um signs and I think it will be Bottas um in there um I think it will be a Ferrari one two three definitely bold little question though very very much a hypothetical but if signs is leading Claire behind him nobody else anywhere near to Ferrari stop them Adam they have to I, I think we've got to that point now where Red Bull, or I know a lot of people say, oh, it's early in the season. And I'm certainly one of them. I think, you know, I, I didn't want to see it because I wanted to see if Max could get past Checo without DRS because I wasn't confident that he would. But, you know, we'll never know. But I think Ferrari have to. You know, they're in a fight now. And Sainz has given Ferrari absolutely no reason to not put him in that number two role. He's firmly put himself in there um, with all due respect. So I think if he's in that position where he could win the Monaco Grand Prix, as painful as it will be for him to do that, he will have to, the call will come. Whether he does that though is a completely different thing because he signed that new medium term deal. In his mind, he might have no reason to do that and may feel, well, look, I'm in front. I've put myself in this position. You want me to deliver for you. I'm delivering for you. So you can't take that off me. And it's a first win potentially for signs. If he'd won a Grand Prix already, fair enough. But 
I'm not so sure that he's going to, you know, play that role if he's up, if it's asked of him. I don't I think. Agree. I don't think it'll be asked anyway. I think. I think it'll be pre-discussed, but I don't think it'll be asked on the radio because I think it will just be ridiculed to fuck like the Red Bulls are, oh. and you know Ferrari seems to be playing nicely at the moment and everyone loves a Ferrari and you know as they say race on Sunday buy on Monday um and you know Ferrari need to play that nicely nicely game and I think they will play it and let them let them fight it out on track you're not going to get a this is this is early in the season we're not going to get the new championship winner and I don't think it's the point Differences isn't going to make too much difference in chasing for Stapp and back up in the points. Well, we'll have to see. It'll be interesting for sure. Sorry, Adam Gore. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, to, in reaction to that, Carl, um, it's quite interesting because I, I, I agree with that logic. I think Ferrari do tend to pussyfoot around this a little bit. Um, and, you know, they are a team that, you know, since the old Fernando is faster than you team radio they've always been a bit timid to try and execute team orders particularly with Vettel and Raikkonen so many times it cost them in Germany 2018 I think Ferrari cleverly manufactured a change of positions at the Monaco Grand Prix I think was it 2018 when they did that with Raikkonen and Vettel I think Raikkonen was winning they put Raikkonen on the worst strategy and got and allowed Vettel to overcut him um and which you can do at Monaco and that got him the position in that way and a lot of people thought oh well they cleverly manufactured that result without actually having to give Kimi Raikkonen the order to let him through. They might do something like that with science, or as you say, they might be timid and want to try and be nice about it and just think, oh no, we'll let it go. And then it just ends up in a mess and Verstappen somehow wins the race. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that literally is probably what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, wow. oh, they both God. end up in the water. <laughs> well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens. It's very much alphabetical where it's going to happen. Or we don't know. We, we really don't know at this stage. Um, it's going to be competitive for sure, I hope, between the uh, Red Bull and the Ferrari. Um, now, I've given my bold prediction. I think, in a way, a lot of you guys have done yours. Um, Carl, you said that Bottas will be uh, on the podium. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, what's yours, Adam? What's your bold prediction? Sorry. That was... Oh, yeah. That, well, mine was also Bottas <laughs> would be on the podium. Yeah. But I can right. give you another one if you want. Yeah, I'm sure we can do another one. Go on. Uh... Go on we'll give you a chance. Uh, <laughs> Latifi finishes the race. Oh come on, man! Don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Edward sucks him. All right, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go completely against and be Mick Schumacher fanboy again and say, "Go on, Mick's gonna get points. Why not? This will be yes. the one. This will be the one." Yes, Mick Schumacher for the points. It's the new George Russell for the points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not so bold anymore, is it? Hamilton, no, beats, really Hamilton beats George Russell. Yeah, that's not gonna happen, is it? Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> No, I generally think Hamilton will be Russell this week. Uh, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, um, he showed some promise, so hopefully. Is it um, seriously since Bahrain that Lewis mm-hmm. is the last time he's beat George? That's mad. You'd, you wouldn't believe it if someone had said that to you, that Back Russell up. was beating Lewis in the last five races in a row. That's yeah. mad. Yeah, and he has. I'm just looking oh. at the results now. He absolutely has. <laughs> um, yeah, you, who's number you one? George Russell was mid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the statisticians or the, some of the fans in the comments or whatever will be able to tell us, but has Lewis Hamilton ever been outraced five times in a row by one of his teammates? And it's been oh. a long time. You'd have it's going to be, um, the, it's gonna be in the McLaren era, hasn't it? With... You'd have to go Jensen Button, probably. Button. In yeah, Button, that's what I was thinking. 2012, it would have been, possibly. Or or even maybe more, maybe, Rosberg. Yeah. I don't think Rosberg did five in a row against Lewis in 2016. No, because that was quite tight, wasn't mm. it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like two. There was things that three at the start of the season where he won three in a row. I mean, if you go back to 2015, I think Rosberg won the last two races in a row because Lewis wrapped up the tie to win the US race. So I, technically, you could say five in a row from the end of 2015 to 16. But I mean, we're clutching at straws, oh, geez, aren't we? Sure, clutching me. It's, I'm it's trying. I'm red. trying. <laughs> I'm it's just very rare. That's the yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Very rare this this happens to Hamilton. Um, not, not saying he's gone off the ball by any means. I just think Russell's been that impressive, and obviously Cole does not think that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you if you enjoyed the show, be sure to like us on Facebook and find us at F1 Chronicles. Same with Twitter as well at F1 Chronicle. 
Uh, and obviously we do do these shows live after each race. And as well, hit us up on TikTok as well. I do a 60 second video pretty much every week doing a doing a hot take. I think this one will head of Monaco will be about Daniel Ricardo. I uh, was kind of going off of what we've uh, said about in <laughs> this in this episode today. Anywho. <laughs> um, and yes, we're also available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Verbal Omni Studio, Pocket Cast, and the F1 Chronicle website itself, f chronicle.com. Uh, guys, I'll give you a chance to plug. Uh, Adam, I've mentioned that you are part of the DF- DNF1 podcast. Uh, what is that and where can people find it? Uh, yeah, so you can find that. Just type in DNF1 on YouTube. You should be able to find us. Of course, we're all major podcasting platforms. Just type in the DNF1 F1 podcast. And George, just to check, when are you doing your quality review podcast? Is it straight after qualifying? It'll be straight after qualifying, yeah. I don't know what time. I'm stuck in my head probably no. about, about four o'clock, something like that, probably. On Fair Saturday. enough. Well, if guys, just to be a little bit cheeky, if you want to do a quality watch along with me and watch that along with me, guys, you can do that. Just type in DNF1. And when you're done with us, you can hop on over to Grid Talk to check out George and the gang to review qualifying session. And we can all come together and discuss why Danny Ricardo is not indeed mid and why he is actually the king of Monaco after all, because we're all a bunch of frauds. What do we know? We're just fans. <laughs> Get your shoes at the ready, lads. That's it. Humble <laughs> pie is already ready to serve. I'm ready to eat it. Oh, there's always a few batches ready for us on Grid Talk. It's just inevitable, <laughs> really. We, we, eat, we eat it on top of the fence because we're always sitting on it. But there we go. Um, <laughs> not really. We, we never sit on the fence. That's something we absolutely do not do. Um, which is something you guys don't do on Monkey Seat either, Carl. <laughs> No, not at all. We're the most opinionated, uh, sweary, rude, uh, slightly crazy. We don't, we are two best mates that sit there and chat F1. Uh, we're rather out there compared to the, the niceties of Grid Talk. This is very formal compared to our complete <laughs> banter fest and abuse fest. Uh, we say it as we see it. That doesn't make it right, but it's always a good laugh. Uh, we're at Monkey Seat Pod. Um, on all socials and yeah look up the Muggsy podcast um, online and all your podcast favourites um, I think we're on everything and we're also on YouTube as well um, we do lives but we, we're a bit sporadic because myself and Tom do crazy jobs uh, so we're a bit sporadic as to when we appear but check follow our Twitters and we always put it out that we're going live on those yeah, definitely check out both of those shows. I def- I always listen to them in the gym and stuff like that. I always enjoy listening to both of your guys. I don't want to be thinking about you working out to me and Tom chatting. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, you know, that goes <laughs> to something. That's all I'm going to say. That makes me feel pretty weird now. I might stop doing that. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> oh, but yeah, so that, that is just a little taste of the band that you can get on Monkey Seat Podcast. Um, What's your favourite workout to do, George, while you're listening to Carl Banter, <laughs> F1 Drivers? Well, Right. Okay. This is getting even weirder. So, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't select the podcast based on what exercises I'm doing. I just go there, I do my exercises, and I just listen to whatever, whatever podcast uh, is is newest on my Spotify. So that's uh, it. But no, it's, it's definitely the bicep curls. So, definitely uh, the squats, yeah. isn't it? Definitely uh, squats. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, mean, I was going to give them an out and go cardio or weight, but you just went right for it, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> You set them up, (laughs) knock them down. All he needs, he needs to do a PB on the bench. He just listens to you to say, George Russell's mid, right, I'm listening to PB now. I'm mad, I'm angry. (laughs) Oh, God, I do love doing this show. And I just want to mention as well that uh, I don't think I'll be on this weekend, but this weekend's Monaco Grand Prix will mark the 200th episode of Grid Talk uh, on Sunday, which is just absolutely bonkers to think about, like... Thanks to everybody who's listened and oh, thank you. Thanks to everybody who's listened and downloaded and followed and subscribed and liked and everything like that, everything in between. It's been it's been a huge journey and we're, we're here for the long haul. You know, we're here to spring every race this season. We'll hit 250, I think, before the season's out as well, which is another big one. So, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks for everybody who's come on the show as well. That's incredible panellists over the years. Um, so, yeah. So we'll Shame about us, though, though, Adam. Yeah, <laughs> bottom of the barrel. <laughs> That's where one nine nine and not two hundred. It's yeah. all gone downhill this weekend, hasn't it? What can we say? But yeah, <laughs> but just in time for it to go uphill back to the casino. Let's yeah, so we'll be there for qualifying about I think, four o'clock, something like that, UK time on Saturday to review that. So thank you very much for joining us, lads. I do really do appreciate it as always. Yeah, See thank you for having us on. And yeah, we're back on Saturday for Monaco qualify. Thank you very much and goodbye.